All right, folks. Well, we are on week five of our series on evangelism. And since we are sort of at a halfway point, I want to just go through and provide a real quick recap for you, especially if you've missed a week or two, um, just to kind of catch you up and let you know where we've been. Um, so in week one, we looked at the fact that our evangelists are made and not born, right? And we talked about this idea that we can look at someone like a Billy Graham and think, well, there's no way that I can be evangelist if that's what an evangelist is. But we looked at how each of us are called to share the good news with people that God puts in our paths. Um, in week two, we took a little bit of time to consider the starting point for our evangelism and realize that um, there's a real need for us to expand our thinking, to go back to a bigger starting point. Um, because when we invite people to say, you know what, you need to consider a life with Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. Well, that's very true. It's not all that appealing and it's not necessarily big enough for people to um, understand the importance of that relationship. Now, in week three and four, we did sort of a mini-series within the series, and we spent time um, reflecting on our theological understandings and belief, and we called that looking inward so that we could go out. And so in week three, we asked questions about who God is and what God does, and then the last week, we um, reflected on how we are to respond based on the answer to those two questions. And so this week, then, we are going to move forward again, looking more at a, um, a practice, I guess, or an understanding as we begin to approach um, evangelism, and that is looking at context. So friends, let me read to you um, our scriptures today, and I'm going to say that at first glance, they may seem a bit odd to you, but I think you'll understand where I'm coming from as we get in to the heart of the message. So here, um, from Isaiah 1.1, which is often called the superscription of the, the book, it says, This vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, the kings of Judah. Our gospel reading this morning comes from Matthew 4, verses 23 to 24. And it says, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering with pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them all. So friends, as we begin today, I want us to consider a question, and that is, what do real estate and evangelism um, have in common? So what is the number one rule in real estate? Location, 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 right? And we've all heard it many, many times, right? And it's this idea that um, you can have two identical properties but based on the location of that, those properties, one may increase in value or one may decrease in value just based on that variable alone. So let me give you an example. So if you were to go out and let's say you're looking for an apartment, you want, you're, you're just a single person, you figure, well, I can do with a studio apartment, six to 700 square feet of space for me to live in. But you decide, you know what, I want to go out and experience the big city life. I'm going to go out to San Francisco and look for a studio apartment. Well, if you do that, that apartment's going to cost you about $3,400 a month in rent. All right? So maybe you go, well, maybe that's just not quite for me. So I might just stick a little bit closer to home. So you start looking for that same studio apartment in Eau Claire, and you find that it's only going to cost you $835 a month to rent. Um, so you can see the difference and you can understand that idea of location, 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 because those spots, that variable plays a big role in, in the cost and the determination of the value of that property. Now, friends, I think we might easily say that the same is true when it comes to evangelism. But rather than location, 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 we might better say context, 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 right? Because each place that we go, we have to navigate through the different layers of context so that we're able to reach the heart of certain people, all right? And so, friends, 
today's message is going to be a little bit more of a teaching message, um, and we're going to lean pretty heavily into Mark Teasdale's book, Evangelism for Non-Evangelists. But we're going to do that because as we talk about context um, and we look at things like culture and different things, it's such a wide and expansive field. It's an interdisciplinary field, right? It deals with psychology, psychiatry, sociology, just immense broad fields. And yet I think he has a very interesting way of just putting it in a simple, um, uh, providing it in a, a simple explanation so that we can understand it. All right, so let's go through and let's look at some of the different contexts that we will have to navigate through as we engage in evangelism. And then we'll also look at how Isaiah and Jesus um, navigated through those same contexts. So I've called these four different contexts the four horsemen of, of context, right? And so just the same as the four horsemen in the book of Revelation, they each represent a different facet of contextual knowledge, okay? So the first one is the individual. And as we approach evangelism, we have to understand that we bring an individual context, right? Each of us has our own context that we operate out of. And as we approach someone else, they have their own individual context, right? And so part of it might be their identity or personality characteristics that they have. It might be feelings um, emotions, or it might be likes and dislikes that they have, and they bring that to the table, right? And so we have to understand this then as we look to go out and to um, share the gospel message with other people. So for instance, you know, if I grew up in a pretty rural area like this, right? I grew up just, you know, half an hour away from here in a small little town. You know, if you go and throw me in New York City and say, go to work and start evangelizing people, I'm going to be a little out of my element, right? Because I'm not used to the big city. Just the, the size and the amount of people might throw me off, right? Or you could look at something and say, you know what? I'm a pretty introverted person, right? And so I'm not going to probably be the Billy Graham that stands in front of a stadium and proclaims to 20, 30,000 people the gospel message. Now, I will say if God called me to do that, I would grit my teeth and go do it. But I can guarantee you, as soon as my time was done, I'd be out of there as quick as I, as I could because I'd be squirming to death because of how uncomfortable I would feel as someone who um, is introverted. All right. And so, again, we need to understand these things about our, ourselves, but also understand that um, as we approach and look to share um, our faith with someone else, they bring theirs and we have to create a bridge across that right? So if we take a look at someone like Isaiah, we understand that, again, he grows up in a very specific context, right? He's a prophet in Jerusalem, and that, that context provides an understanding for how he will go about and do his ministry. Likewise, Jesus grows up in a specific context, right? He grows up in a tiny little town called Nazareth, right? And he has to learn to interact with people in the big city of Jerusalem. He has to learn to interact with religious figures who come from a different part of, of context, a different system within that, all right? So the second horseman then of context is culture, okay? And Teasdale will define this as the meanings that have developed over time and are transmissible, Right? And so it's pretty easy to say, you know what, we understand at least on some simplistic level what culture is. Right? We can say that as Americans, we have an American culture. Right? And if we were to go someplace else in the world, and let's just say we go to Africa or to China or someplace like that, the culture changes rather dramatically to go to one of those places. Right? And we have to learn how to operate in that. Right? And so if we go to, to some place like China, guess what? They don't even do something that we do all of the time when we meet somebody. Rather than offering their hand for you to shake, that's not their custom, right? They bow. They have a totally different cultural greeting, and we have to understand that or we can really get off on the wrong foot in a quick hurry, right? So... <clears throat> Oftentimes, when we think of culture, again, we think of geographic areas, right? So again, we can think of <clears throat> something as broad as a nation, or we might say that, you know, even the small towns of Bloomer and New Auburn have their own cultural context, 
right? Because again, if I were to go to New York City, the way I evangelize and share the gospel in Bloomer and Auburn might not be the same as it is in New York. And it's definitely not going to be the same um, if I go to some place like Africa, right? There's a whole bunch of different cultural variables that I have to work through. Um, there can be cultures within age groups, right? And so there can be a baby boomer culture, right? That has a certain set of values and, and beliefs. And that that baby boomer culture looks a whole lot different than a Gen Z culture does, right? Different values, different perspectives, different ideas. And so even um, as we look to do ministry, we have to figure that out. So if I'm going to go in and I'm going to teach the youth group, you know, I have to figure out a way to build a bridge from my Gen X um, understanding and belief to go down into that that adolescent age and, and find ways to connect with the beliefs and perspectives that they have. And sometimes that's a really hard thing to do, right? All right. So one of the examples that I would share then is, is a time when, when I studied abroad and I went to Australia. Okay. And so when I went over to Australia, I didn't find a whole bunch of cultural differences, right? It was pretty easy for me as an American to go in and, and to navigate the Australian culture, right? They spoke English as their main language. Yeah, they had some funky dialects and some different slang that took a little bit to get used to, but overall it was pretty easy. However, when I came back, I actually experienced reverse culture shock. Because their culture is so, or at least was at that time, so laid back, when I came back to the busyness of America, I was out of my element. I was just completely disoriented. You know, when I would sit there and go for a walk, or I would go and sit there and talk to somebody in Australia, it was no big deal. You just, it was like time didn't really matter that much. But when I came back here, there was all of these deadlines, and I had to move, 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 or I was late for stuff, right? And I just, it took me a long time to get back into the swing of, of being in American culture. Now, again, friends, as we approach the, the, the study of the Bible, one of the things that I always do is, is go in and try to teach you a little bit about the, the context, right? And I know some, for some of you, you roll your eyes, they glaze over, and you go, oh, Josh, please don't talk about historical context and stuff. You're going to put me to sleep. But the reason we do that is because um, in order to, to understand how that scripture was presented and to gain an understanding of how the original audience looked at that, we have to look at that context, right? Because each author of the book of the Bible speaks into specific context. And if, you, if we don't understand those, it makes it difficult for us then to try to interpret the scriptures for ourselves because we don't understand what they originally meant. So as we look again at the, at the figure of the prophet Isaiah, again, he grows up among the people of Israel, right? He has that, that traditional Jewish understanding of, of what it's like to live. He understands their customs. He understands their language. He understands the symbols um, that are part of that culture. But guess what, friends? What happens in 587 BCE, right? Babylon comes in and destroys every fabric of the way of life that these people are used to, right? And the prophet then has to go in and speak into that situation in a much different way than he does at the beginning of the book when he's criticizing the kings, right? Because it's very different to be criticizing the kings for potential political actions they're going to take and then all of a sudden say, you know what? My people are struggling and I have to somehow figure out a way for us to make sense of what's just happened. All right. Now, Jesus has to do the same thing, right? If we look at the birth story of Jesus and maybe he doesn't remember this part, but think about it from Mary and Joseph's perspective. They have to leave town to quick get Jesus out of there and they go to Egypt, right? They have to learn a whole different cultural context and they stay there for multiple years. When he comes back, Jesus again grows up in a Jewish culture. He has to navigate that, understand that. But then he also has to deal with what might be called some subcultures, right? He has to deal with religious groups like the Pharisees and the Sadducees who have their own beliefs, their own values, their own symbols. And then he has to deal with people like the Samaritans. And we know that the Jews don't like Samaritans because they see them as half-breeds, right? There's a lot of ethnic 
um, animosity between the true groups. And then, not only that, but the, the Roman government um, has already conquered this area, and so he's having to navigate that as well. And so again, friends, context or cultural context can be sometimes almost overwhelming to think about. The next horseman is, is society. And for many of us, this might be a little bit of a struggle because oftentimes we think society, culture, they're the same things, right? But what I would define these as, or what, as, what Teasdale defines these as, as the structures that a group develops to order their life, okay? So how many of you have ever heard the saying, it's all Greek to me? right? Most of us have had that. And this is what happens when we move into societies that we're not familiar with, right? So if I go in and I start talking to somebody about insurance or taxes, I just sit there and just like you guys, sometimes my eyes glaze over and I go, just please speak English. Tell me what in the world this means because I don't understand the terminology. I don't understand the vocabulary. I don't know why I have to put certain numbers in certain boxes because they, you know, it's just like, I don't get it. Here, just take it and do it for me so that I don't have to go through the, the, the difficulty of working through that. All right. And so, friends, sometimes we have to work within societies, right? So think of it, even in terms of the church, we can say the church structure is a society, right? There's a whole bunch of symbols and structures within the church that we as Christians and those of us who come to church understand how to navigate pretty easily. But if you're someone that has never, ever been to church before, imagine what it's like if, some, if you walk in these doors and somebody goes, hi, we're glad you're here, have a seat, and they don't tell you anything else about the service, right? You're wondering what in the world is going on. So all of a sudden there's a call to worship and you're invited to stand up and to say these words and you're thinking, why am I standing why am I saying these words? What does this mean, right? And so, again, we would tell someone, like, well, there's going to be a call to worship. And it's an invitation for you to prepare your heart and mind for worship. And we're going to say some words that speak about who God is. And we're going to, or we'll inv invite God to do certain things for us as we go. And the reason we stand and the reason oftentimes call to worships are responsive is because we're inviting you to participate, right? We've created a ritual that initiates you into the act of worship, all right? But if we don't explain those things to people, they just sit there and go like this, and there's no wonder they clam up like this, and as soon as the service is over, they run out the door because they're scared to death because no one helped them navigate um, the society and the structures within that society, all right? So as we turn back, and again, as we look at um, society and the structures for Isaiah, again, at the beginning of the book, we understand that he's, again, he's talking from a from a, a context in Jerusalem, and he's talking specifically into the royalty, right? He's dealing with the political affiliations and decisions of kings. But as I said, as, as stuff goes sour in a real quick hurry, as the Babylonians come, he has to some way speak into and provide a message of hope and an understanding to the people of why this has just occurred. He has to go in and, and create symbols and different things for them to understand. And friends, I would say Jesus did this the same way as he would go and preach in the synagogues or in the temple. He had to learn to navigate those structure, structures because again, he's just a normal guy. He's just a carpenter's son from Nazareth, right? And he has to navigate those structures. Think about his life as he prepares for the crucifixion, right? He has to learn to navigate the um, legal structures, both Jewish legal structures, which he probably to some degree understands fairly well, but he also gets thrown into the Roman legal system, right? And he has to figure out how to do that. And he has to sit there and say, well, how can I do ministry even in this? And you say, well, Pastor Josh, he didn't say anything the entire time he was being tried. But again, think of, think of the effect that he has on even someone like Pilate, right? It's a simple question where he begins to make um, Pilate ponder what the meaning of truth is, right? Jesus is doing ministry even though he's not saying anything because he's navigating through um, that context. Now, friends, the final horseman of, of context is what, I, what we'll call community. Um, and oftentimes communities 
operate within larger structures of culture and society. But the difference between, the, between communities and societies and cultures is that um, people voluntarily join communities, right? Like we were born, most of us here were born as Americans. We really didn't have a choice. And Mar American culture has just sort of formed who we are because we've lived here our whole lives. Communities, on the other hand, are things that we choose to join. And so they provide sort of this customized experience. And so, again, how many of you are part of a club of some kind? Maybe you're part of a bowling club, or maybe you're part of a book club, or some other thing. That community provides you with a set of values, or at le very least provides meaning for your life because you enjoy the activity um, that that club offers, okay? And so that is what we might best describe as a community. Now, communities can also help us resist the overall culture, right? Because sometimes communities can provide alternative sets of values and beliefs that um, will prevent us or help us resist the formation of culture. And I'll get into that in a minute. Now, as we look at the prophet Isaiah, again, it's kind of tricky here because we don't have a whole lot of information on who the historical figure of Isaiah is to say, oh, he did all of these things. But the only thing we can say with any certainty was that he was from the line of prophets. And if we consider the prophets to be a specific community within Jewish culture, we know that they did certain things, right? And so in Jewish culture, it was the priests who constantly and who constantly proclaim messages of forgiveness and mercy to the people. The prophets, on the other hand, were not so gentle. Oftentimes they proclaim messages of judgment um, and injustice, right? And so they're not always the most liked people that we run across in the scriptures, but they have a very vital role. Jesus, too, creates a small community, right? He starts out with a small group of disciples and he brings them in and says, look, folks, we're going to do things a little bit differently, and we're going to live a little bit differently, right? And here are the things that I'm going to teach you. And as you go out, we're going to transform and speak into the culture, right? And so we hear Jesus say, you know, you have heard an eye for an eye, but I tell you if someone slaps you on the cheek to turn the other cheek, right? And so Jesus speaks in and begins to transform the culture through the values that he offers, so friends, let's go in and let's talk then about developing evangelistic communities because I think that that's really an important thing. And so I've just had the opportunity through school to, to spend time learning about some of our Methodist history, right? And one of the things that really stuck out to me um, in, in some of these studies is how John Wesley um, created these evangelistic communities, right? I think we can all agree John Wesley was a pretty um, charismatic preacher, right? He could walk through the streets of London and draw crowds of thousands to tens of thousands of people. And so he had a gift for preaching. But I think his even greater gift is his ability to organize people because as soon as people received his message, he quick hurried up, put them in small groups and says, look, friends, this person, I'm going to provide a leader for this group and you're going to meet with this group weekly and you're going to continue to learn more about your faith. And as you grow deeper in your faith, you're then going to go out and you're going to do ministry and share the gospel message with other people, right? And as he does this, as he creates what are called bands or societies, it really ignites um, a religious renewal, a religious revival, if you will, as all of these little groups start popping up all over England. And as it travels over to the Americas and some of the pastors and ministers that he ordains go to America, the same thing starts to happen because they've created these small individual communities. Now, Again, Teasdale says that there's some certain purposes that go on then with these communities, and one of them is that they can move into a place of quarantine or isolation. And he says that normally we think of this as a bad thing, but he says it's very important because what they do is they isolate themselves from the pressure, from the influence of culture so that they can discover their identity and determine their values. Okay, And that there's times that that's very important to do. And so even within the church, we do this to a certain degree. Right? When we have a Bible study, we come into that place and we sort of isolate ourselves from 
the culture of things and say, okay, we're going to study God's word and see what God has for us and, and to more deeply understand our values. As we grow in that, then we move to what he calls syncretism, where we look and say, okay, how can we begin to interact in and with the culture that, that we live in, right? How, do my, how can I reflect my beliefs into the culture? And then finally, he said there's a, a period of reform where just like Jesus, we say, you know what? Culture has given us some good things, but there's also some things that we want to change, that we want to reform, that we, don't, we just don't think are right. And so we're going to speak into the culture and to try to change the culture. Now, he does go on and say that there are certain ways of responding to the culture, what he calls the four C's. And he says most of these are good and they're at times appropriate responses, um, but they sometimes fall short. And so as we look at this, friends, one of the ways that we can respond to culture is we can condemn it, right? And so let's just take a movie, for instance. Let's say a movie comes out and it just is the antithesis of everything we believe, right? Well, as Christians, then we would say, you know what? We're going to condemn this movie because we don't believe that this is, it's not only not good for us to watch, but we don't believe it's good for anybody else to watch either. So we're going to condemn it. We're going to maybe make a proclamation and say, you know what? We're going to boycott this movie because we, don't, we, we just don't think that it's good. Or we can critique it, right? We can say, well, there's some things that are good about this movie, but there's these points over here that we don't like, right? And so let's, let's you know, let's critique these things and, and encourage them to do better. Or we can say, you know what, the movie's actually pretty good. Maybe we should just copy it and we'll make our own version of it in a certain way, right? And we've seen things like Christian film come out. Or the case that I think stands out even more is Christian music, right? That this idea that a lot of Christian musicians and artists look at certain sounds and certain secular groups and say, I really want that sound, I really want that image, and I'm going to bring it over here into Christian music. But Friends, I sometimes question that because it's like, why not just be your own band, right? Why not create your own original sound? Yes, you're going to be influenced by different sounds that you hear, but you can some, most of the time you can discern those groups that are really into their own identity and really doing it because they have a passion for creating the worship, right? So I would say a group like Casting Crowns, right? Like, they're, they didn't really care. They don't have a sound that necessarily sticks out as something that's completely secular, but they created just good, powerful worship music, right? Their lyrics were strong, their sound was good, and they were popular for a long time in the, in the music that they produced. The other one, and this one is probably out of your genre of music, but is a band like Skillet, right? And this is a hard rock band that I, that I enjoy listening to, but they're one of the few Christian bands that have been able to cross over from both Christian music to secular music, right? And they've gotten, there's been controversy on both sides because the Christian group says, why in the world are you going to all these secular rock fests and being with all of the, the dark and heavy music that's associated with with you know, hard rock in, sec in the secular line of thinking. And then they're over here in the secular line performing at these fests and doing these um, concerts. And they've got people saying, hey, man, I really like your sound. You, you, it's, it's really awesome, but we don't want to hear you talk about Jesus, right? And so, but they've just said, look, this is who we are, and this is the, this is the music we're going to produce. And they've been successful in moving through both dimensions, okay? And then finally, friends, the last response is just simply to consume it, right? That we say, you know what? This song that's, that culture has produced is good enough. We're just going to enjoy it for what it is, all right? Now, friends, again, all of these at different times are appropriate responses to things that culture puts forward. However, like Teasdale, I don't think that they go far enough because it always puts Christians and the church in a, in a state of reaction, right? We're always responding to what culture puts towards us rather than saying, you know what, as Christians, we're going to put in to the culture. We're going to look to speak into the culture, right? And so one of the things that I would encourage us to think about is how can we as Christians in the church cultivate and create our own stuff? How can we create just good quality movies that people want to watch that express our values and our beliefs? How can we create good music that, that people want to listen to, but it doesn't have to have the sound of some great secular rock band, right? When we go into the workplace, can we create products that, 
really represent our values? You know, can we make something that, that's a good product but doesn't use forced labor from other companies? Or can we come into the workplace and say, you know what, we, this, this workplace is, is a toxic culture and we want to speak and we want to transform the, the culture of the workplace that we're in. And friends, the, the number of opportunities is really limitless. And so let me end with this. What are you going to cultivate and create this week so that you can speak in to the culture around you, to speak into the lives of the people that God places in your path? God bless.